We will start with the ABCs of salvation. We are looking for the soon return of Jesus. And so uh, the, the way that you're ready for the rapture, you know, how you are rapture ready, how you are righteous before the Lord, how you are worthy to be raptured is Jesus's worthiness and Jesus's righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin so that we can become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. So it isn't righteousness that we earn. It's not about being good enough or working hard enough. It is about putting your complete trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that what he did on the cross is enough. And so tonight we're going to look at the Feast of Trumpets and specifically on the crowning of the King of Kings related to the Feast of Trumpets. And so one of the names of the Feast of Trumpets um, that's been passed down is the crowning or the ordination or the coronation of God as King. And so we're going to look at the Feast of Trumpets through that uh, window, especially tonight. And so, um, and one thing, a reminder here is that God entrusted his feast and uh, the word there, feast, these, these seven feasts of the Lord that we like to track throughout the year because this they are a mini picture of God's redemptive plan for mankind from Jesus's first coming to his return. It's all right there in the seven feasts of the Lord. And so feast there is the word moed, which means a dress rehearsal or an appointment with God. So God said, these are these appointments, these dress rehearsals where I am calling Israel to come and meet with me. And so he entrusted these to Israel to protect, to pass as priest to the world. To reveal himself to the world. But these feasts are not just for Israel. They are for all mankind. Because these feasts hold the redemptive plan of mankind in them. And so one thing that um, that sometimes you hear, which I think is just um, wrong, <laughs> is that, well, you know, we can't uh, we can't as a Gentile expect God to do something for the Gentile church on a Jewish feast. That um, is 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 really kind of ignorant when you look at what God has done for the church on the feast of the Lord. And, you know, God, th- these are his feast. They're not just Israel's feast. They are his feast showing his redemptive plan. And when you look at his pattern and what he's done, I think you will see that the feast of the Lord are very much for the Gentile church. And uh, so first off, we look at Passover. And what did Jesus do at the feast of Passover? Well, he came as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world and his sacrifice has for the most part when you look at passover you look at jesus fulfilled it with his life his death and his resurrection he died at passover just as the lambs were slain he was buried during the feast of unleavened bread being that that without sin uh that matzah that, that perfect picture of, of sinless life. And then he rose at the feast of first fruits. So you have the first three feasts of the Lord that were fulfilled by Jesus. And who is the primary benefactory, primary benefactory of these first three feasts so far? It's actually the Gentile church because it's the Gentile church that has received Jesus as their lamb. It's the Gentile church that has received Jesus as her savior. Now, the Jews will. They've been blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So one day they will see this. But right now, the ones primarily benefiting from the first three feasts of the Lord is who? Us Gentiles. And so we can't really say that these feasts are for just for the Jews because Obviously, that's not the case because Jesus died for everybody. 
And without Passover, you wouldn't be saved. Without unleavened bread, you wouldn't be saved. Without first fruits, you wouldn't be saved. And then we come to the fourth, fourth feast of the Lord, Pentecost. This is when the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit indwells believers today. And he was the primary ones that have benefited from the Holy Spirit coming on Pentecost. The church. The church. Jesus came to the Jew first, but it is the church for the most part so far that is the primary benefactory of what Jesus has done. And so... As we look to the Feast of Trumpets, how could we say that its fulfillment wouldn't be a benefactor to the church? So the Feast of the Lord are for all mankind, and it's primarily the church who has benefited from the fulfillments as of yet. And it will be that way until we are taken out of the way and everything is opened up to Israel in a way that I think, I think Paul gave us a, a little picture of what's going to happen to the nation. So in Acts nine, after Paul met Jesus, um, he had this experience and he was blind for a while. Well, after he was prayed over immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. I think spiritually, during these past 2,000 years, Israel has had something like scales. They have been, as Paul said in, in Romans 11, they've been blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. After the rapture of the church, after the fullness of the Gentiles literally come in, those scales are going to fall from their eyes. And these Four feasts of the Lord that have already been fulfilled, and it could be five feasts of the Lord by then. The scales are going to fall down and they're going to suddenly understand that Jesus is their lamb, that Jesus is their unleavened bread, that Jesus is their first fruit of the resurrection, that the Holy Spirit is God's word written on their heart. And that Jesus is is for them as well, their Messiah as well, and their king. And so all that they're going to understand. But as of right now, with four out of the seven feasts of the Lord, it's obvious that they were for the Gentile as well as the Jew. And the final three will be fulfilled by Jesus in connection with his return and the climax of God's redemptive plan. And so the fulfillment of the feast, they were entrusted to Israel, but Israel has missed the fulfillment because they missed Jesus. They can't understand how Jesus, how Jesus has fulfilled the feast because they missed Jesus. So they're not going to interpret them in light of Messiah. But this will come to an end during the tribulation period. That's when the scales are going to fall from the eyes. And that's when they're going to start to see these things. So Israel has not only missed the fulfillment of the feast, but Israel's also missed some key signs along the way. And understand, Scripture says God tells us that signs are for the Jews. But they've been missing signs because they haven't had the key, which is Jesus, to interpret them. And so due to being blind in part, just Romans 11, what we just talked about, Israel has also missed some key signs. They missed the star that heralded Messiah's first coming. They missed the star. Now, notice it was Gentiles that benefited from that sign. It was the Gentiles that took the, that took the information that Daniel had given them and they followed the star. It was Gentiles that found the Messiah. Uh, and followed the signs way back then. And so Genesis 1, 14, God tells us why he created the lights in the sky in the first place, why he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. 
And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and to let them be for signs. And that word signs there means a signal or a marker and for seasons. And that word seasons can mean moed, which is a feast or appointment. So those seasons can also mean not only just the seasons of the year, but it's specifically the word there is moed, which is the same word that's used for the feast. And so these signs point to special feast days, which is all part of God's calendar that he wanted his people to follow every single year to keep them, to keep them close to him, to teach them, to, to keep, can you continue teaching them? And so also for days and for years. So God created the, the stars, the sun, the moon, all to help people know literally what time it is, literally what day it is but also for signs and for the moed, for the, for the appointed times. And so that brings us to a neon sign in the sky right now. And you look at this and <laughs> this is a lot. I'm not even going to try to explain all of this right now, but this is a Revelation 12 sign given to us in Revelation 12. And this is the... Um, this is Virgo in the sky. And so what's interesting to note, just like God said for for signs for for um, Moed, for seasons, you know, it's the Feast of Trumpets when the constellation Virgo is clothed in the sun and the moon is at her feet. Then that means that the Feast of Trumpets is has begun. This is the setup for when it is time for the Feast of Trumpets. This is, um, as you look at, and I'm not going to get all the way into the constellations and, and what that is, but that is an ancient way that God communicated really the gospel with his people. Is they could look up in the sky and they could see the entire story of God in the stars. Now, the enemy has hijacked it. Um, with, uh, you know, with, with like, what's your sign and, and, and paganism and all of that. But its core from the beginning was to communicate God. So in Revelation 12 here, this, the sign that's in the sky immediately tells you of a time. It immediately tells you that this is the Feast of Trumpets that John is seeing. A sign is a marker for the Feast of Trumpets. And what's interesting about all this, which just looks like a whole bunch <laughs> of, of names here, these are all um, mostly a, mostly um, asteroids and some uh, some comets that are actually in this constellation right now coinciding with the Feast of Trumpets this year. And so this is very interesting because it is literally a neon sign in the sky that tells the story of what's going to happen during the seven year tribulation. And I'm not going to go through all this stuff because it would just take way too long. And I'm not the one to explain all this, but the first, the first bit of it that was discovered was that in her womb and child actually comes out of her womb this Friday night, this Friday feast of trumpets, as we're celebrating um, the Feast of Trumpets and Rosh Hashanah, child will be coming out of the womb of the woman in the sign, the Revelation 12 sign. And so you have, you literally have an asteroid named child that comes out. You literally have an asteroid called United Nations that comes out before then. You have major players, Wormwood. You have major players, of the seven year tribulation and you have a story that's played out in the sky that, and remember the signs, this is, you know, this is exciting watchmen all over the planet right now. This is extremely exciting to see something like this that we've never seen before that we will never see again. It's, it's incredible to see this much detail and, and this in the sky it is just incredible. But I don't know that this is necessarily that we are the primary audience for this sign. 
I, I think after we're gone, it's going to be Israel that is going to look at this and is going to be able to see a mini story, not only of the seven year tribulation, but also of the story of Jacob, because there's lots in here. And there are people that do a great job of actually detailing the story that is here. But there's also a comet that was just discovered on um, 8-11, that was just discovered um, August 11th, and it's called Hideo um, Nishimura. And so this comet, it, it's very interesting because it hasn't really done anything at all. It was just discovered and um, out of nowhere, after not doing anything for over 400 years, comes and pings this constellation right on Rosh Hashanah and then goes back in its place and doesn't do anything ever again, basically, for at least the next thousand years. Doesn't move, just stays in retrograde. And so it's interesting because it's like uh, I heard one watchman describe it as it's like God's throwing a stone at the Revelation 12 sign to get our attention and say, OK, look what I did. <laughs> Um, but I, I think it's incredible here that we literally have child coming out of the womb right on Rosh Hashanah. And exactly what it means, we don't know. But it is the sign that God talked about in Revelation 12. And I believe it's actually more for Israel than it is for us today. And we talked about the Revelation 12 sign and Revelation 12, specifically looking at the scriptures we talked about that a couple weeks ago. And because when you look at Revelation 12, you were looking at from Israel's perspective, the re the revelation, the seven year revelation. And so the woman here is Israel. And so if we read Isaiah 26, 17, 17 through 21, like a woman with child that draws near the time of her delivery is in pain. And crieth out in her pains. So we have been in your sight, O Lord. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. And so right here, so far, you have a lineup to what happens in Revelation 12. You have the woman who's in pain of labor. And her child is harpazo. The word for what happens to her child in Revelation 12 is harpazo is raptured. The same word that we have for rapture, harpazo, caught up. Well, here in Isaiah, it says that we have, as it were, brought forth wind. And that will be in a lot of ways for Israel what it feels like when the rapture happens. They're in birth pains. The birth does not benefit them. They're still here for Jacob's trouble. We have not wrought any deliverance on earth. Neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Immediately, you know, after we're gone, there's going to be chaos, but it won't be long before a seven year covenant is made. And the world power keeps going and crushes the world. And the Antichrist takes power. The world, um, the world powers would not have fallen. They would gain strength. The dead men shall live. That's what happens at the rapture, isn't it? The dead come alive first. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing that you dwell, you that dwell in the dust. For thy dew as the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out her dead. That is exactly what happens in the rapture. The dead rise first. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers. And shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, maybe seven years, <laughs> until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. That is the seven year tribulation. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. And so we see here a par parallel scripture to Revelation 12, talking about the woman, which is Israel, in the birth pains, and she gives birth to the wind. And, of course, the Holy Spirit is referred to as wind. You don't 
you know, know where it's going. You can't see it. And we are going to, in the twinkling of an eye, be brought up to the chambers and shut the door. The door is going to be shut behind us. And we're going to be hidden with Jesus for a little while until the indignation overpasses. And Israel will be left here, but the scales will fall from her eyes. And she's going to begin to put together the pieces. And so what does God say in Revelation 12? Re Revelation 12, right after you see the rapture, you see the woman in pain for childbirth, you see the rapture happen, and then God takes her and he feeds her. And that, I believe that is what's going to happen to Israel during the first three and a half years. The scales are going to start to fall. They're going to start to figure things out and they're going to start to learn about how Jesus did fulfill these things. They're going to have the two witnesses. And it was interesting. I was listening to a brother talk today. They're um, in the scales, which are right by her feet, probably about down here, are an, an asteroid named Moses and an asteroid named Elijah. And the scale is right below her feet. It's like God just has everything so perfect. And so after we're gone, the two witnesses will be here and they'll be revealing. There'll be 144,000. All that will be happening. You know, God says, Jesus said in Matthew 24 that that it, that um, the gospel will go to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. Well, that happens during the tribulation period. How God's word goes to the ends of the earth. There's two witnesses. There's 144,000 and there are at least one angel proclaiming the gospel. The gospel is completely given to all the corners of the earth during the tribulation period. And so the Jews here, they require a sign. And Jesus said that there would be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars before his return. And it's interesting because a couple of the first things that were spotted in relation to this sign were the child and then Yehoshua, um, which is you know a Hebrew variation of Jesus's name at her feet. And then an asteroid called United Nations, which is interesting, being that United Nations is is a key player right now in in setting up this one world government and this one world power grab that they're doing. It's very interesting that you have actually um, right as child is born, United Nation comes out just right before the child. And so right there together, neck and neck. So 1 Corinthians tells us, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block. You see, the Jews, he's been a stumbling block. They haven't been able to benefit from the first four feasts that have been fulfilled because they can't see past Jesus being the Messiah. They don't believe that, so they can't benefit. They can't see these signs in the sky because they're not looking at the book of Revelation. And so he has been a stumbling block as of yet. And to the Greeks, foolishness. The Greeks, they think this stuff is foolishness. They think trusting in Jesus is just silly. But unto them, which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. Because we believe that what God says in his word is going to happen. And we have our faith strengthened all the time because it's literally playing out before our eyes. So this sign, this sign in Revelation 12 starts with birth pains. And uh, it's interesting because I, I was listening to some gentlemen talk about the sign um, because there was a similar sign um, in 2017. And they were talking about the uptick in birth pains since that time that everything escalated so quickly. And, you know, right now it's like we're in transition labor. You know, The birth pain is on top of birth pain. There was just another earthquake. There's everything is on top of one another. 
And but these birth pains really started to intensify and the enemy really started to intensify his plan right about that 2017 time frame. And so so at first it starts with these birth pains and then the dragon emerges and we do see how the enemy is positioning himself uh, with the global government ready. The rapture and then in Revelation 12 is followed by an overview of the entire seven year tribulation. First three and a half years where Israel is fed and nurtured. The final three and a half years where she runs and God protects her for the final three and a half years. So here we see the comets, the asteroids that are found in this sign are like a neon billboard detailing the final week of Daniel's 70 weeks. And so they're going to see this. They're going to see this sign. They're going to see this research that their brothers and sisters in Christ um, have done. And, and I think it's going to answer questions and help them to, to see, to navigate what happens in the following, the following years. And so another thing that's happening right now, we can't ignore when they, <laughs> the UN, <laughs> when, when they quote scripture, and this is phenomenal to me. It's, and you wonder, okay, is it that the enemy has to tell us what they're doing? Do they, um, is it that God is prompting them to say some of these things? Um, are they punking us? You know, what what is going on? Because they are quoting scripture, but it appears that they're unaware that they're doing so. But here we have peace and safety over everything. The um, here are the 17 um, SDGs uh, for s the sustainable development, the whole one world, um, you know, global new order here. Uh, they're they're saying no one left behind. And after the rapture, they're going to be the ones left behind. Uh, peace and security in this new agenda for peace. This is the common agenda brief. Uh, that they'll be going over this fall. Peace and security is used 39 times. I mean, you you have to try to use that phrase that many times. And one thing that hit me, and, and I don't know, this just came out of the blue, but 39, what's the significance of 39 biblically? 39 is the number of, of, of lashings that Jesus got that Paul got twice It's 39 because they, they couldn't legally give like 40 was considered like a death sentence to be, to be um, lashed 40 times. So it would be 40 minus one. So it's 39 times. And here this peace and security is really a lashing because it's through peace and security that sudden destruction is through peace and security that really their plan of, dominating and taking over everything it is going to happen and and so here this is all about strengthening and the word the very word in daniel 9 27 confirm um that word gabar means to strengthen it means to make stronger make greater it's not creating a covenant out of the air it's taking a pre-existing covenant and making it stronger and so here we have next week International Day of Peace, literally Peace and Security Day. And so all of this is happening right here around Rosh Hashanah. And what and what is interesting around the Feast of Trumpets, what is interesting, too, is that it's always this way. You know, the enemy, he does not know when he's going to get the green light to go for tribulation. He doesn't know that. It, it's not Satan's choice when the tribulation begins. He is being restrained until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Once the restrainer's gone, then he can move forward. Then the covenant can be made. But as of right now, he's just guessing and he's got his ducks in a row and he is always ready around the fall. Around the fall feast time, he's always ready to go. And so that's interesting. Um, and here, this is this is them. They're saying we need seven years of accelerated transformation action to achieve their 2030. And here, 
peace and security. This is their this is their UN page. To save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. So they're they're quoting, literally quoting scripture. There's peace and security, the scourge of war. Here, Isaiah 28, 15, this is what Israel does. This is the mistake that Israel makes. And Israel's very much a part of this, has been a part of it since the beginning. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death. And with hell, we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge, same word, shall pass through, it shall not come upon us. For we have made lies our refuge. And under falsehood, we have hid ourselves. And so Israel thinks if they play nice with the world government, that that'll protect them from the scourge of war that's coming. And you see that right now. They've got, they are surrounded on all sides. Um, Iran and Iran's proxies are surrounding them. The only thing, I really think everything's on hold. It's it's just they can't, everything can't break through while we're still here. And so it, it's amazing to see how everything keeps building, keeps building, but then it just holds. And so this brings us to the Feast of Trumpets. And so we've looked at the sign. We've looked at some key things that are happening around this time that shows us that this is a very prophetically charged time of year. It always is a very prophetically charged time of year. There's a reason that the enemy um, chooses this time to make his willing and dealings. But the Feast of Trumpets is definitely something for us to pay attention to. This is the most mysterious of the remaining feast. Remember, there's three feasts left to be fulfilled, and they will be fulfilled by Jesus's return. The first four were revealed with his first coming. The last three will be revealed in relationship with his return. So this is the most mysterious of the remaining feast. The Bible really doesn't tell us much about it. And that's interesting. So Leviticus 23, 24 in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. So God tells us that this is a memorial or a time of remembrance. But he does not tell us what we're remembering. <laughs> you know, he said, you're going to remember by blowing trumpets. But he doesn't tell us what we're remembering. He doesn't tell us what this is a remembrance of or what it is a memorial of. So this is unique because all the other feasts of the Lord are explained. The purpose for the feast are explained in all the other feasts except for this one. Trumpets is the only feast that remains a mystery. And I don't believe that it's a coincidence that another mystery in scripture is the bride of Christ. We're also a mystery in scripture. But for now, we can only say, you know, what if? When it comes to the Feast of Trumpets, because we are not going to know what we are remembering until it happens. And then generations will look back and they'll know very well what it was always supposed to be about. And so <clears throat> some other names, which I think are just really, really cool. These are some other names of the Feast of Trumpets. The Day of Blowing, of course, is the Day of Blowing of the Shofar the day of remembrance, the birthday of creation, the day of judgment, the day of concealment or the hidden day. Um, and then, of course, you have the beloved, um, you know, the beloved idiom. No one knows the day or the hour. And so this is the only feast of the Lord that isn't happening on a full moon. That isn't happening in relationship with a day that you can count to. See, all the other days, of all the other feasts of the Lord, you can count to them. You already already had the first one. So, you know, when it's the the 10th, like Yom Kippur or, or Passover happens at the full moon, you can, you know, you can calculate it. This is the only one that's hidden because the new month cannot begin until two witnesses spy the first slither of the new moon. From Jerusalem. So that's why it's a two day feast because you don't know 
when it's begun until it's already begun. It's literally the feast that no one knows the day or hour of. It's literally the concealed or hidden day. The Sabbath of Sabbaths is another name for it. The day of remembrance, the day of blasting, the day the world was conceived, the day of awakening the dead, the day of awakening the dead. Okay, (laughs) that is a name for this feast. The coronation of the king or the coronation of Messiah. The wedding ceremony, the opening of the gates. And I've also heard Jacob's trouble, but I haven't been able to find that confirmed from a strictly Jewish source. So I was trying to make sure that we're not kind of blending with what we want a name for it to be. Um, But here we have opening of the gates. And so wedding ceremony, coronation of the king, uh, the, the, the hidden day. You know, so the day of awakening the dead, so many of these names for someone watching for Jesus and watching for the rapture, there's no wonder that the Feast of Trumpets is a favorite for rapture watchers and a favorite time of of what ifs, what if it's the Feast of Trumpets, you know, what if it's the Feast of Trumpets this year, you know, it, it's it's no wonder that that is excitement that follows around this feast of mystery. And so um, the origin of these names, these names for the most part were derived from rabbis attempting to figure out the same mystery. They were trying to figure out what are we supposed to be remembering? And so they pointed to 10 remembrances from scripture that they have um, connected and hung on and understand there are no coincidences when it comes to God and what he does. He shows his people who he is through their traditions. And a lot of the traditions that they did with the lamb ended up being specifically fulfilled in the life of Jesus to the very moment, you know, God had worked out, the traditions to fit with Jesus perfectly. And so it's interesting to see these things and to see how this feast is celebrated today and to look at it through prophetic lenses. And so um, there are 10 basic um, or or 10 buckets really of remembrances that they've connected with this. Um, One is the coronation, coronation of God. And they're linking that to, um, to the to creation, that God is the king of the earth and coronating him, crowning him as king of the earth. Repentance is a remembrance that we need to remember to repent and turn back to God. Sinai and the Ten Commandments and having God's God's word. Um, a warning, which is very much because remember, the books are opened. Um, and there's this warning of impending judgment. The temple, this is the time where they look forward to building the third temple. The binding of Isaac, and that goes back to the very core of, it's the trumpet, the shofar, that goes all the way back to um, the binding of Isaac. Fear, judgment, in gathering, the people gathering together, the in gathering of God's people and resurrection. And so all those names stem from these 10 remembrances that the, uh, that the rabbis combing through scripture have hung and have, and have placed around this feast. So today I want to focus on one of these names that has really caught my, caught my attention lately. Um, The coronation of the king or the coronation of Messiah. And so this is this is really, really cool. So scripture records that the shofar announces the coronation of the king. You know, we read this in in Kings. We read uh, about it in Psalm. This is especially interesting in that Jesus is the creator. Remember, the the whole idea of coronating God as king is because he's the creator. Well, Jesus is the creator of all creation. He is the creator. Jesus is the creator and the anniversary of creation is celebrated on Rosh Hashanah. 
And that's also, um, according to most scholars, when Jesus was most likely born was during the fall feast, definitely, and um, between Rosh Hashanah and Tabernacles. But it seems more and more evidence is coming clear that it was probably Rosh Hashanah, probably actually even September 11th that particular year, and that would have been Rosh Hashanah. So for him to have been born here, the creator, king creator, born on the anniversary of creation, coming to usher in his new creation. It's just so, so exciting. So that um, and the creation that was completed at the end of creation week. So uh, yesterday was September 11th. And that was um, on the on the Hebrew calendar, Elul 25. So that would that was the anniversary of the beginning of creation to where Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets is the anniversary of the creation of man, the completion of creation. So it's interesting to note who God refers to as a new creation. Second Corinthians 5, 7, 20, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So what if, what if this new creation's birthday, rapture day, when the woman gives birth to the child, is the very same birthday as our king, as our bridegroom, as creation itself? What if the new creation is born on the celebration of creation? That would be a very cool balance. And we don't know. We have to wait and see. But we are his new creation. He is our king and he is our bridegroom. So the crowning of Jesus in Revelation, we see this crowning of Jesus in Revelation. We see... Um, here we see that Jesus is crowned with his with his bride's crown. He he wears the crown that he chooses to wear are the crowns that we give him. And I was thinking about that. You know, when you make something, you know, I was thinking about necklaces and things and trinkets and stuff that my girls have made me throughout the year. You know, you wear that and you wear it with pride because your child made that for you. And I'm getting ahead of the study just a little bit. But when Jesus comes back, he's wearing the many crowns that have been cast at his feet. That's the crown. Those are the crowns that he chooses to wear, the ones that we give to him. And so Revelation tells us of the crowning of Jesus. Revelation 4, 10 through 11. The four and twenty elders fall down before him, before Jesus, that sat on the throne and worship him, that live forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. Who created all things? Jesus. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. So who are these elders? Who are these people that have just cast? I kind of gave a giveaway. I said, it's us. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so who are these elders? How can we prove that scripturally? And they, the elders, sung a new song, saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals. Remember, traditionally, according to the, um, you know, according to the custom and the way that Rosh Hashanah is celebrated, the books are opened on Rosh Hashanah. And you have 10 days until Yom Kippur. Uh, those books are opened and you can change what's been done. So, so here we say, you are worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof for thou were slain and have redeemed us to God by thy blood of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and so who are these people they have been redeemed you have redeemed us who does jesus redeem he redeems mankind he redeems people by the blood out of every kindred so this 24 represents every 
kindred of people, every tongue, every people, every nation is represented here, the bride of Christ. And God has made us to be rulers alongside with him. So the book of Revelation has a total of 404 verses and um, that are within them. There are almost 800 references to the Old Testament. So in order to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand the Old Testament. And, and that's where sometimes where, where people have made a flaw is that they don't, you know, they want to unhitch from the Old Testament. Don't worry about the Old Testament. Um, but then you can't understand the new if you don't understand the old. You especially can't understand Revelation if you don't understand the Old Testament because it is all in that context. So when reading Revelation, understanding of the Old Testament is key. And as we look at first Chronicles, there are 24 courses of priests that are given. And so those are those are jobs. Those are positions, priestly positions that are given. And so here, 24 represents positions of authority. 24 could be likened to spiritual giftedness and ability and position that, you know, we um, when we're raptured, it's not like our job is over and we're just like sitting on clouds and playing harps for all of eternity. <laughs> not at all. We are very busy. We're going to have positions of authority. We're going to have jobs. We're going to have things that are entrusted to us to do. And so here are these 24 elders. They represent us. They represent the full body of Christ. The bride of Christ is the redeemed to God out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. And we're present. Notice this. We are present when Jesus receives the scroll. This right here is pre-tribulation proof. We are present when he receives the scroll. Before he ever starts to open up the scroll and the horses ride, we're there. We are there. And so the scroll hears the deed to earth. And so here you see the king being crowned and receiving his kingdom. Right here, in the beginning chapters of Revelation. In Revelation 4, 5, you see him receive his kingdom and begin to take authority over his kingdom. And he's opening up the seed to earth with us as witnesses right there with him. So we've already received our crowning ceremony. So that's another hint here too. In order for us to have crowns to cast at his feet, that means the Bema seat judgment has already happened. At this point. So here John and Revelation 4 is called up to the door. He hears a voice like a trumpet. That's the rapture. He is called up to heaven and he immediately sees us. So we at this point have already been raptured. We've already had our Bema seat judgment. And we are now with the understanding that nothing that we've done was us. It was all Christ through us. He, you know, every good thing we've done is is what the good works that God has ordained for us to do. And he laid them out before us that we would just walk in them. You know, none of it's us. And so understanding that we just cast all those crowns right back at his feet. And when he returns, it's those crowns that he's adorned with. He's adorned with many crowns because he is so proud to wear the crowns that we have given him that that you know how awesome is he here he he's kept he's kept the nail the nails in his hands and his feet he's kept the the slash in his side he's kept the name of lamb that's his most prized title is lamb in the book of revelation and he comes back wearing the crowns that his bride has given him and so he's crowned before he returns to earth. And so all of this is, is beautiful pre-tribulation proof text. And so Jesus at his return, this is a description of our king and us with him at his return. His eyes, Jesus's eyes were a flame of fire and his head were many crowns. And he had a name that no man knew but him, he himself. 
and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Again, that takes you back to John 1, where the Word was with God, the Word is God, the Word put on flesh. The armies which were in heaven, this is us, followed him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress, the fierceness of, fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so as he returns, and this is a very telling picture, you know, the armies of the world are going to be assembled to try to fight him. Maybe this is what the enemy is trying to work on so desperately now to be ready, to be ready because he knows this day will come. So what's next? What are we looking forward to? You know, uh, we're looking forward to the Memorial of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets will continue to be a memorial. It's going to continue to be a, a mystery until it isn't. Until we see firsthand the fulfillment that God had in mind all along. You know, God's not wondering, what am I going to do? What's this going to be? He knows full well that he's kept it a mystery. And maybe because the mystery is tied to the mystery of the church. Remember, this feast will be celebrated and understood like we understand Passover and Pentecost throughout the millennial reign. There'll be a 1,000 year reign where people will know full hand what this is a memorial of. And I wonder what we'll be remembering for now. We can only say, you know, what if, what if? And so what's next after the Feast of Trumpets? And that's the 10 days of awe. And God willing, we'll unpack all this a little bit more next week. But the 10 days of awe or those that time before between Rosh Hashanah. Remember, Rosh Hashanah is two days because you don't know the day or hour until it started. It's hidden day. And so if you count the days in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there are seven days. This is a week. There is a week left of Daniel's 70 weeks, a week of years. There are seven years left. And we have a pattern here of the days of awe of seven days. And so here, the days of awe is a time of remember, of, of um, repentance growing closer to God, digging in the Sabbath time that will fall during this. Um, The Sabbath is called the Sabbath of return during this time. And so here the book of life and the book of death are opened. And what is done will have everything to do with whether or not you're inscribed in the book of life or the book of death, which is what happens during the tribulation period. People have another chance They can still be inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life if they receive Jesus during the tribulation period. And if not, if they take the mark, if they continue to reject Jesus, then they'll endure the second death. And then after that is the Feast of Yom Kippur, um, Tishri 10, the 10th day after, after Rosh Hashanah, after the Feast of Trumpets, is Yom Kippur. And so the days of awe get more and more sober, more and more repentant until Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is the holiest time of the year, according to God. And this is when the books in heaven that were opened on trumpets are closed and everything is sealed for good or for bad. Remember, when Jesus returns, which most scholars believe will be on Yom Kippur, Um, When he comes back, the sheep and the goats have already been decided. Those who he's coming to rescue see him as the rescuer. Those who those who are against him are against him. And it's it's decided it's done by that time. And so this is the um, this is the holiest time of the year, according to the Bible. And it is interesting to note that as of 30 A.D. for the next 40 years, until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, um, after after Jesus's crucifixion, the sash here for the scapegoat no longer turned white. So uh, on purpose, God had multiple signs to deal with the temple before it was destroyed, letting them know that atonement was no longer offered because 
they had rejected their atonement, which is Jesus. And so five days after atonement, on the full moon, the 15th of Nisan, is the Feast of Tabernacles. And so this is a memorial of dwelling in tents, being in God's presence like they were during Egypt. And during the millennial reign, God will literally be, Jesus is going to literally be in the midst of his people. And after the millennial reign, with a new heaven and a new earth, God will be able to dwell in the midst of his people and they'll be no more corruptible that can't tolerate his presence. And so here we have that so much to look forward to in what will come with the millennial reign and a new heaven and a new earth. And so the final thought here is, you know, what a joy to know that one day we're going to see these feasts fulfilled. You know, these feasts were were fulfilled consecutively with Jesus's first coming. It, it appears they could be fulfilled consecutively with his return, but it almost looks like the pattern here that's setting up is that there's small gaps in between each one. Um, but we'll see. We're going to see the fulfillment of this. Uh, either way, we're going to see how this plays out. And we have so much to look forward to the return and the reign of our king and we'll be returning and reigning with him. So that is trumpets, the coronation of the king.